Welcome everyone, my name is Tim O'Keefe. I'm Colgate's Director of Web Content. We want to thank you for joining us today online. And during our discussion today, our book discussion, we'll hope that you ask questions or post comments on the right hand part of your online screen. Um, we will try to get to your questions at the end of the session and you will be able to present them to our author today. Today's special guest is Frances Wong. She's the author of Transparency and we hope to get started in just a few minutes. So again, thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? You have to say if this is too high. Living Writers English 360 has had its measure of excitement and good fortune over the past two years. And again, we meet good fortune this week. For here we are on October 28, 2010, two days before the official date of November 1st edition of The New Yorker, and actually the very day it drops into mailboxes all over the world. In it is a new story by the wonderful writer Frances Wong. Her story is called Blue Roses, and Frances will be reading from a version of it for you today. She'll probably talk about that sense of versions. Students in the Living Writers class that Jennifer Bryce and I co-teach have been reading Frances's 2007 short story collection, Transparency, which won the American Academy of Arts and Letters Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction and a Penn Beyond Margins Award. Frances's work has been read as part of the Selected Shorts series at Symphony Space and has appeared in places that include Best New American Voices and Tin House. In addition, Frances, who now teaches at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, has received a Rana Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Fine Arts Work Center in Providence, the Mac McDowell Colony, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, and Colgate University. And therein lies a tale. For every year, as many of you know, Colgate University selects O'Connor Fellows, chosen blind, that is based solely on their writing from an enormous pool of entries. The fellows who are chosen come to Colgate to teach two courses, one in the fall and one in the spring, and to write and to write and to write. In the academic year 2004-2005, Francis was one of our O'Connor fellows. And traces of that year find themselves, uh, find their way into fiction. What a joy to welcome her back to Colgate. Please join me in that great pleasure. Thanks so much, Jane. Th and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be back. Um, I have really vivid memories of uh, my year here in Hamilton. Um, I especially remember um, living in, um, the on the countryside um, in a farmhouse that was built before the Civil War. And um, during the winter, um, I would have to build a fire <laughs> every morning in my uh, word-burning stove to just keep my house warm. Uh, so I became very adept at building fires. And um, it was, I felt like it was a very adventurous and, and magical year for me. And um, throughout that year, I, I felt so grateful um, to be at Colgate, to be teaching um, the students, and to be having the opportunity to write, and to um, getting to know the, the wonderful faculty. 
Um, and before I begin, I just it's just, it's such an honor to be here, and I and I want to thank um, Jane Pynchon and Jennifer Bryce for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Blue Roses. It's a really it's it's quite a long story, so I'm going to read half of it, and um, it's a little changed in that um, it, it was originally 40 pages long, and then I had to cut 10 pages. Um, for uh, The New Yorker, and I've sort of reinserted a few <laughs> things that I, I, I couldn't let go for this reading. So it's a little different from what appears in, in the magazine. And can everyone hear me? Is it good? Okay. okay, Blue Roses. A few months ago, I asked my daughter if she could invite my good friend Wang Pei San over for Christmas dinner. Wang Pei-san's husband, Hong Wen-fu, died last year, and the only family she had was a daughter who had gone away on a Caribbean cruise without her. It's true that my friend has a habit of irritating everyone around her. She has a piercing nasal voice and believes that she sounds like one of the ladies from the Beijing opera. Her large head tilts and sways as she speaks, her fingers curving through the air like birds. But in spite of her many delusions, she is my friend, and I didn't want her to spend the holidays alone. Mom, my daughter said in her childish sing-song way, I'm not really friends with Mrs. Hall. I am used to my children thinking only of themselves. I didn't push the matter. Everything would have been fine, except that my daughter called me back later that evening. Mom, she said, I feel bad about not inviting Mrs. Hong over for dinner. It's okay, I said. You don't have to feel bad. My daughter hesitated. Conrad says that if you want to invite her, maybe you should have the dinner. I should have the dinner? If you want to invite her. You want me to host the dinner? It was just a suggestion. Eileen, how old are you? You know how old I am. Well, I've waited your whole life for you to invite me to dinner. Now you want to take it back? <laughs> Mom, I hung up the phone. It was really too much. The more I thought about it, the worse I felt. It was a small thing, but what had my children ever done for me? When they were babies, I chewed their food before putting it in their mouths. I held my daughter's skirts high above dirty public toilets. When my children asked me for anything, I looked in my purse and found what they wanted. I gave them tissues to dry their eyes, cough drops to soothe their throats, napkins to dispose of their gum. I wasn't a magician. My purse must have weighed 20 pounds. But if I wasn't prepared, I was found lacking. Eileen called me the next day to ask whether I would babysit her children on New Year's Eve. She is so naive. She didn't realize that anything had happened between us. I told her that the Joes had invited us for a poker party that night, also that I wouldn't be going to her house for Christmas dinner. Then I set the phone down. Of my three children, Eileen is the sensible one, my husband's favorite. She is what we wanted her to be, a doctor, capable and even-tempered. Elizabeth, our second daughter, is the one who picks fights and criticizes us. Andrew, our last, is careless and without ambition. I gave birth to him when I was 40 years old, and ever since I've had high blood pressure. When he doesn't do what I ask, I tell him he comes from a rotten egg. Eileen doesn't usually fight with any of us, and she stays neutral when we fight with one another. Like me, she is efficient and no nonsense, although she does have a sentimental streak about family and home. Each year, she sends out fancy Christmas cards with her two beautiful, exquisitely dressed children pictured on the front. From her serene manner, you'd think she was above petty human emotions. But I remember when she was a two-year-old in pigtails, how she shrieked when I brought her sister home from the hospital, how she jumped up and down when she saw me feeding Elizabeth with her bottle. After that day, she refused to take a bottle, drinking like an adult from a regular cup. She slapped Elizabeth's face and even tried to throw her out of the crib. I had to spank her for the first time in her life. 
She howled, a little animal in pain, holding onto my skirt and following me from room to room, even though I wanted to be left alone. I was afraid that her ill will toward Elizabeth would be permanent, but eventually she forgot her resentment. She grew older, more distant and polite. Now she is a picture of calm, my daughter, with her flat chest and dry, rough hair. The only hint of inner turmoil is the way she erupts in, pim in pimples every few months, a sign that her hormones are out of whack. The phone began to ring again. I knew it was her, and I didn't pick up. My blood pressure was rising, and I had to lie down. The world seemed to wobble and shake, and I felt as though a pinball were bouncing around inside my head. My husband walked in, saw me lying on the couch, and picked up the phone. I closed my eyes, listening. Don't worry, I'll talk to her, he said to Eileen before hanging up. I looked at him. The last time I babysat their children, Conrad came home early, I said. And do you know what he said to me? I don't know what you and Eileen arranged, but you can leave early if you want. He said this like I was nothing but a servant. I wanted to say, you know, I don't need your permission to leave. You aren't paying me, are you? And then do you know what happened? I opened the refrigerator to get my leftovers. And do you know what he said to me? What are you looking for? Stealing more of our lasagna? He was making a joke. I said, this bag of food is my own. I wanted to remind him how many times we had treated him for dinner. When his relatives came to town, we treated them as well. Do you remember how his brother ordered two entrees? When is Conrad ever going to reach into that pocket of his and treat me, huh? Whenever we go out to a restaurant and the bill comes, he just sits there, smiling like a dummy. My husband went to the closet and took out his coat. He held it over his arm, waiting for me to finish. I've taken care of their children all these months, and I asked them a simple favor. Please invite my friend over for Christmas dinner. No, they say. She's not our friend. We don't feel comfortable. OK, fine. But then you know what they say? Why don't you host the dinner instead? It makes me feel so bad. I wish I never had children. Lin Fanghui, don't think like that, my husband said. That's how it is. You do a lot for your children, but you can't expect them to do the same for you. Well, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm very upset. I'm going to get the car fixed. Do you need anything? No. He left. I was angry and took two tranquilizers. Wang Pisan called to remind, that I, to remind me that I had promised to take her to the grocery store. She used to pay a driver to take her, but he had quit the week before. My friendship with Wang Pisan is strange, I know. She makes everyone around her crazy. Ever since she was a child, she has been indulged. Her life is delicate as a teacup. She had weak lungs, and her parents didn't expect her to live. They bought her larger and larger coffins as she continued to grow. In one of her dreams, Wang Pisan wanders lost in a museum, room after room filled with coffins no bigger than a tissue box. She opens one after another, uh, well, she opens one after another, like Goldilocks, she says, and it exasperates her that she won't be able to fit into any of them. What can you do with a person who has dreams like this? When I met Wang Pisan almost two years ago, she and her husband had arrived late to a banquet hosted by her alumni association. She had the straight, sexless body of a 10-year-old girl, yet she was the most striking old lady in the room, dressed in a cream brocade suit with intricate gold buttons. You can always tell if a suit is expensive by looking at the buttons. Huge, shiny pearls surrounded her scrawny throat, though later she would inform me that necklaces made her collarbone ache. She was a tiny woman with a disproportionately large head. You felt that all her egotism was contained in that gigantic head of hers. Her body itself was as negligible as a toothpick, so it was a shock to see that she could walk. Her movements were, spa were spastic, as if someone else were controlling her limbs. The only two empty seats were at our table, and Wang Pisan and her husband, after some hesitation, sat down next to us. One dish followed another, ham and dates on steamed buns, roasted duck, scallops and shrimp in bird's nest, steamed flounder. But Wang Pei-san refused to eat anything. The only thing she put on her plate was a single crayfish, which she did not touch, as if it were something to look at rather than to eat. We had all paid $50 a seat, 
And here was Wang Pei San perversely fasting and not getting her money's worth. She made us feel that beneath our fine clothes, we were nothing but animals. I regretted the fat folds showing through my dress. There was a time when I weighed 105 pounds. Now, when I see old friends, the first thing they say to me is, Lin Fang Hui, how fat you are. You used to be so thin. But although I'm fat, at least I look young for my age. My hair has red and gold highlights because I dyed with henna. I take estrogen and use a retinoid cream for my skin. When I asked Wang Pisan why she wasn't eating, she said that it was hard for her to find food she liked. I'm not such a picky eater, I told her. My husband isn't either. She looked over at him as he heaped a second helping of crispy prawns onto his plate. It's a good thing, too. If he began having strong opinions, we'd be a two-headed monster. We'd have to separate, her husband said cheerfully, as he decapitated a shrimp with his chopstick. Wang Pisan rested her check her cheek against her shoulder and asked, so in your marriage, who is harsh to whom? Before I could say anything, my husband broke in. I let her do what she wants, he exclaimed. You know why? Because I married a goose who lays golden eggs. He began bragging about my high-ranking job at CSIS, which I had retired from two years ago, and I had to pinch his leg sharply under the table. My husband always feels a need to impress people who are richer and more cultured than he is. He doesn't realize that bragging is the surest way to reveal your low origins. If you're involved in international relations, then you must be a realist, Wang Pei-san said. You know what I studied? English literature. I wrote my master's thesis on fairy tales. Give me dreams over reality, she cried. When dessert came around, a cold sweet soup with peanuts, she examined her bowl with suspicion. Well, I'll just try a bite, she said, hesitating as she lifted the spoon to her lips. She swallowed it hastily down and, to my surprise, ate the entire bowl with relish. Do you want some more? I asked when I caught her staring at my half-finished bowl. That is not necessary, she replied with dignity. The soup is too sweet for my taste. At the end of the evening, we exchanged phone numbers, but I didn't expect to hear from her. You meet someone and have a nice conversation. You promise to call. But as time passes, it no longer seems worth the effort. It's hard enough to pick up the phone to call old friends, much less people you barely know. So I was surprised when Wang Pei-san called me a month later. I wasn't expecting it, and in truth, I slightly regretted having answered. I had a feeling that a friendship with Wang Pei-san would be more trouble than it was worth. Lin Fanghui, she said, I was looking through the yearbooks of Zhenzhi University because I wanted to find your photograph. When she said this, I felt sure it was because she wanted to check my background. Well, did you find it, I asked, unable to keep a note of sarcasm out of my voice. Yes, you wore too much eyeliner, but you were so pretty. When I was young, no one ever said I was pretty. Only now they tell me. You know why? Because they see this old face. Young to them is pretty. At Wang Pisan's invitation, my husband and I met her and her husband for lunch at their favorite restaurant. Afterward, we went to their house for tea and cake. My husband and I were impressed by the modern, pristine rooms, the lack of dust and clutter. In the bathroom, there were little white soaps that smelled like almonds. Very little of Wang Pei-san and her husband was revealed by the house, a pale and airy shell, devoid of memories. They talked about their daughter, an attorney who worked in D.C., but I saw no photographs of her or her two children anywhere in the house. Wang Pei-san had an incurable sweet tooth. She had eaten very little at the restaurant, but her eyes glowed now as she nibbled on yellow cake soaked in the blood of strawberries. Her eyes were murky gray, the color of oysters, with the kind of opaqueness you see in the elderly or the blind. When she grew excited, her eyes came to life like dull stones immersed in water. <coughs> Wang Pei-san told us the story of how she and her husband met. He chased me for two years, she said. Every week he visited me at my parents' house and brought me curious gifts. One time he brought me a watermelon from his mother's garden. Another time, a little box filled with magnolia buds. I left the box open on my bureau, and my room smelled so sweet for days. He even gave me a poem he had written. His poetry was so-so. 
not a horse and not a tiger. But somehow his kindness and sincerity touched me. Before we married, he promised he would do whatever I asked of him, and he has been a very good husband to me. When my parents died, he invested the money I inherited, and all I had to do was sit back and watch it grow. The curled tip of her tongue poked out, touching her upper lip. But you see, I never wanted to be married. I wanted other things from life. I didn't want a husband or children. Well, what did you want? I asked. I wanted to write about other worlds, my own fairy tales. I haven't written even one. It's too late to begin now. I've become stupid doing nothing with my life, just sitting on top of my money like a cold, fat snake. Lady White Snake, her husband said, and we all laughed. Wang Paisan gave a discreet smile. She was no doubt pleased by the allusion to the old fairy tale of a snake who wants to experience human love and takes on the shape of a beautiful woman. Perhaps she imagined she belonged in <coughs> such romantic tales. Her husband didn't seem to mind the way Wang Paisan complained about being unfulfilled in life. Probably he had heard it all before. He was an amiable man, a bit plump with thick square glasses. He looked as soft as a sponge. If you squeezed him, the moment you let go, he would return to his original shape. Of the two, he seemed much the healthier person. How could any of us know that he'd be dead before the winter was over? One evening, as he lay on the couch reading The Economist, his heart stopped. Only a few days before, he'd had a premonition of death. Looking at Wang Paisan, he had said with a slight smile, if I die, I don't expect you to live too long after me. <laughs> it wasn't a curse, Wang Paisan told me. He was merely stating what was obvious to both of them. And, in fact, less than a year would pass, and Wang Paisan's lungs would no longer be clear. But I am getting ahead of myself. Wang Paisan asked me to take her to the grocery store because she couldn't drive. She hadn't driven a car in years. I assumed that she was too small or weak to manipulate the car. Her feet might not reach the pedals, or she might have difficulty seeing over the steering wheel. I made her brown tea eggs and a sour cream coffee cake to satisfy her sweet tooth. When I arrived at her house, she seemed quite pleased by my offerings. You made this yourself, she asked. I got the recipe from the internet. The cake has a lot of butter in it. It looks so tempting. I almost want to eat a piece right now. Well, why don't you? I have to brush and floss, she said. I don't feel comfortable unless my teeth are clean. We walked to the front hallway and abandoned our slippers for walking shoes. Mine were black, sensible, well-cushioned shoes, while Wang Paisan's were metallic gray with an orange stripe, as if she were about to embark on space travel. <laughs> I often have nightmares about my teeth, she said. I'm chewing on a piece of caramel, and my molars get stuck together. I can barely open my mouth. Or my teeth become sharp and pointed, like I've turned into a vampire. She opened the closet and took out a lint roller, applying it to her clothes, even <coughs> though they didn't have the slightest speck on them. Do you have recurring dreams like that? I don't remember my dreams. This was not entirely true. I often dream of going shopping and being frustrated by my purchases, but this type of dream did not seem profound. <laughs> you don't remember? As if to console me, she gently moved the lint roller up and down my sleeve. I brushed her off, <laughs> shooing her out the door. I forced her to sit in the back seat of my car. But I want to sit out front so I can talk to you. She frowned as she struggled to put on her seatbelt. You're too small, I said, leaning over and snapping her in. What if I hit something and the airbag comes out? You'd be instantly killed. She nodded slowly. You think of everything. <laughs> At the superstore, I pushed the shopping cart and followed Wang Paisan up and down the aisles. She wanted to buy artificial tears because her eyes were too dry, but she couldn't decide which size to get. When I told her it was more economical to buy the larger bottle, she worried it would go to waste. To end her agonizing, I dropped the smaller box into the cart, and she nodded bravely. But before we walked down the aisle, she plucked it out and exchanged it for the larger one. She worried and debated over every item on her list. She bemoaned the colors of nail polish and dis disapproved the cost of toothpaste. 
With stiff, cunning fingers, she broke open plastic seals, unscrewed jars of ointment, squirted dollops and lotion into her palms. This one was too greasy, that one too watery. She sniffed, making a face. Who wants to smell like baby powder? She had to be careful. The last lotion she purchased had given her a rash. There was one she bought two or maybe three years ago that had been just right. Why didn't they sell it anymore? At any moment, I expected the manager to come and throw us out of the store. Wang Pisan ended up buying no lotion at all. At produce, we came to a halt over a bag of lettuce. She, she searched through the bags, complaining that none of them looked fresh. I felt cold and lightheaded under the fluorescent glare. Every now and then, the vegetables were automatically misted. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. You are a very picky person, I snapped. If you want a bag of lettuce, choose one. If not, let's go. I began to walk away with the cart. Wait, just one moment. This one looks fine. I grabbed the closest bag and threw it into the cart. But that one has carrots, she said, following me reluctantly. I don't like to eat carrots. In the car, she took out her cell phone, and I heard the slow, painstaking push of each button. Hello, RMA, how are you? She spoke in impeccable English, haughtily enunciating each word. No, I'm not feeling better. I don't think I'll live for too much longer now that your father is gone. I wanted to tell you that you don't have to take me grocery shopping. Yes, that's right. My good friend Lin Feng Hui took me out today. She's very good to me. I could not have asked for a kinder friend. When she hung up, our eyes met in the rear view mirror. I realize I must have been difficult, she said after a pause. Before I could stop myself, I apologized as well. I have a short temper. I'm not as patient as I could be. That's true, she said. <laughs> My husband was a very patient person. I realize no one can be as patient with me as he was. She sighed, looking out the window. He hasn't been dead for a year, and already my daughter is taking advantage. She can't wait to get her hands on my money. Just last week, she and her husband forced me to hand over $10,000 to avoid the inheritance tax. They're so tactless, already planning my death. I felt sympathy when I heard this complaint. Nevertheless, I resolved never to take Wang Pisan shopping again. I am 61 years old, and I have to take medication to control my blood pressure. Though Wang Pisan was a small woman, I could not handle her. A few days before Christmas, my husband and I drove to the airport to pick up Elizabeth and Andrew, who both live in San Francisco. I had ordered them to book separate flights home because I can't stand the idea of losing two children at once in a plane crash. <coughs> Elizabeth was the first to arrive, and then we had to wait an hour for Andrew's plane. On the way home, they made fun of me for getting my eyebrows tattooed. When I was young, I made the mistake of plucking my eyebrows to a pencil-thin line. That was the fashion then. But after years of ruthless plucking, the hair did not grow back and I had to draw my eyebrows on instead. Then a friend told me that I could have them tattooed. But why did you do it, Elizabeth asked. It's so unnatural. If I didn't, I'd have to draw them on every day. So what's the difference? Doesn't it bother you that it's permanent? No, I like it. Mom, Andrew said, you look scary. <laughs> it's too dark, Elizabeth agreed. You're like that woman from Mommy Dearest. Both of them laughed, and I looked over at my husband, who was smiling slightly. I flipped down the car's visor and examined myself in the mirror. My eyebrows were thin, not thick, like Joan Crawford's. It looks good, I said. Anyway, I don't care what you think. Elizabeth sighed. She always takes things so personally. I remember she was offended when I told her to go to Taiwan to get double eyelids. It's a simple operation where they cut the skin above your eyes, then sew the flaps together to make a permanent crease. Your eyes look enormous. I do it myself, but I already have a husband. <laughs> it's not too late for you, I told her. With big eyes, maybe you could find your Mr. Darcy. But Elizabeth only frowned. I'd never do that, she said. It's so fake. The girls always end up looking startled. I think it looks good. All the movie stars do it. They have huge, unearthly eyes, just like those Japanese cartoon girls my son is in love with. <laughs> Elizabeth says they all look the same with their round eyes and straight little noses, but who cares if he can look like that? <clears throat> in another life, I want to come back as a movie star. 
That night, Elizabeth knocked on my door to harass me about not going to Eileen's house for Christmas dinner. I told her my side, but she continued to pester me with endless questions. She should have been an FBI agent. You're ruining Christmas for everyone, she declared. You're welcome to go to Eileen's house for dinner, I said. I'm not forcing you to do anything against your will, am I? It's such a small thing that Eileen did, my daughter said. I don't understand why you're so mad at her. It seems a small thing to you, but not to me. Don't you think you're blowing this out of proportion? Eileen would have invited your friend if she knew you'd react like this. She just didn't think it was a big deal. That's what upsets me. What? She never thinks how I feel. No big deal, right? Elizabeth gave an exasperated sigh. What I'd like to know is what nice thing has she done for me lately? <coughs> Elizabeth reflected. What about that sweater she gave you for your birthday? I can always buy myself a sweater, I said. Why can't she think bigger? You mean something more expensive? Your cousin doesn't have money like Eileen, but she and her husband bought her father a used Mercedes. Your father and I were impressed. When have our children ever given us a gift like that? It's not that I expect a used Mercedes from you. In fact, don't ever give me a car that is used, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying that there are some gifts that involve sacrifice. You see what I mean? Elizabeth brooded on this. If we don't give you extravagant gifts, it's because we know you can always buy something better for yourself. So what's the point? I'm just saying that the gesture would be nice. After all we've done for you, you kids. Do you have to pay back any student loans like your friends? Do you see any other parents still paying their daughter's rent? Elizabeth pressed her lips together, her face darkening. What I hate is that you all suffer amnesia. If I give you a loan, you don't pay it back. I have to remind you. It's not that I care about the money, it's the principle. Whenever I want something, I have to tell you. I'm sick of it. None of my children ever think or remember. My daughter gave a sour face and said nothing. I went on and told her about Wang Pisan's corrupt daughter. Her parents took such good care of her and fed her tea eggs every morning. Little did they know they were raising a viper. She has no conscience. She asked her mother to give her power of attorney, and now my friend can't sign her own checks. Her daughter routinely raids her savings account. There's a side to every story, Elizabeth replied, just like Eileen has a side, too. Besides, your friend is a little crazy. Well, I'm glad I don't have to depend on you, I said. I know I can't rely on any of my children. If I didn't have my own money, the first thing all of you would do is put me in a nursing home. To this, my daughter gave me a strange smile. Then she burst out, did I ever ask to be born? It's not my fault you decided to have me. And with that, she left my room. I could hear her slamming her bedroom door. She's 27 years old and still has her own bedroom in this house. It's decorated with ugly, falling apart furniture that she calls antique. Posters of morbid women in dark clothes, their faces like masks with narrow slits for eyes. Of my three children, she gave me the most trouble. She was always angry for no reason. When she was four, we took her and Eileen to Florida. And in the car, she wouldn't stop <coughs> crying. There was no pleasing her. Finally, I turned around and said if she wasn't quiet, we would abandon her on the highway. <laughs> this made her shriek even louder. I told my husband to pull off to the side of the road and yanked her out of the car. She struggled and kicked as I dragged her over to the weeds at the road's edge where the woods began. If she didn't stop, I said, I'd leave her here. How would she like that? She'd become a homeless orphan, lost in the forest, no one to feed her, no more pretty dresses. She slipped out of my grasp and dashed back into the car, reaching over to lock her door. As I approached, she panted and glared at me from her window, her eyes glinting when I tried to open my door. She'd locked that as well, and my husband had to lean over to let me in. In the middle of the night, my husband woke me. Lin Fang Hui, I want to tell you this. I think I stepped on a black spider. Already I took one Benadryl. Maybe I should take two. Please check on me later to see if I'm still alive. <laughs> I turned on my side. Do you still have the spider? We can see if it's poisonous. No, I flushed it down the toilet. Stupid. You should always keep the body for evidence. 
Well, maybe I threw it in the trash. Do you remember whether you flushed it down the toilet or not? I don't remember. There was a pause, and then my husband burst out in a piteous voice. Why am I so unfortunate? Usually I wear my slippers. <laughs> Are you sure you got bitten by a spider? Yes, I have a funny, tingling sensation in my foot. Turn on the light. He did, and I squinted, shading my eyes. He was leaning over in bed, holding his ankle. I see nothing, I said. Here, he rubbed the spot, it burns. Maybe if I put some ice. I was thinking that if this spider was poisonous, ice was not going to save him. But I dragged myself out of bed and went downstairs to fetch it. My son's light was still on, and I knocked on his door. What, he said. Go to sleep, I said through the door. He said nothing, and I didn't move, trying to hear what he was doing. Mom, he said after a moment. What? Stop spying on me. <laughs> He thinks I'm a spy ever since I asked to be his friend on Facebook. <laughs> I returned to my bedroom and found my husband in the bathroom looking through the trash can, sifting through crumpled tissues, a discarded newspaper, nail clippings, and matted clumps of hair. He couldn't find the spider. I gave my husband the ice. We went back to bed and turned off the light. Don't forget to check on me, he said. I will. Hopefully, I'll be alive then. Yes. At least we'll get a good deal on my insurance policy. I snorted, and for what? To give to our children. I like to know they will be secure. That's nice. If you die, I'll tell them. I moved my pillow around and closed my eyes. But try as I might, I couldn't go to sleep. It was three in the morning. I was thinking about Elizabeth and what she had said, and I wondered what I had been hoping for when I had her or any of my children what lay in store for them but that their eyes would empty, their skin turn blue? Even my granddaughter Isabel, it was incredible to think about. Even four-year-old Isabel who jumped and skipped, her feet doing little flutter kicks in the air. Only two weeks ago, Eileen had dropped Isabel off at my house. When Isabel realized that her mother had left without her, her face reddened and her eyes clouded, and I could do nothing to prevent the impending storm. I want mommy, she sobbed. I want mommy. I tried to calm her, but she continued to cry and ask for her mother. So I said with some annoyance, I want my mommy too. Where's my mommy? Because my mother had left me, and this was the greatest calamity of my life. Did she understand that? Isabel looked at me, and perhaps she understood, because the next moment she opened her mouth and let out a long, piercing shriek. When she stopped, we gazed at each other, and then I said, I am sadder than you. Your mother is coming back in an hour. My mother has disappeared for good. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, Jane. taken out of the story that you just put back in. Um, ambivalent about those cuts. Uh, if it's published again, you will, you will have the sadder story. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, there's some things that um, uh, my fiction editor cut that I think were really judicious and that I, I, I don't miss at all. And I think all the cuts that she made, I mean, I understood that there was limited space, you know, in The New Yorker, and she had to get the story down to a certain number of pages. And so I, I, I understood, you know, all the cuts she made. Um, but I think that if I ever, you know, publish the story in a collection, um, there are some things that I'd like to keep, you know, the thing, some things that I miss that sort of um, elaborate a little bit more on the characters and develop them a little bit more. Um, or some, you know, jokes that I that I want to keep, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, so I'll probably reinsert those. Other questions? Do you, are there any questions? Oh, sorry, did someone have their hand up? Um, just out oh, of yeah. curiosity, yeah. what were some of the things that were cut? Oh yeah, from this. Um, let's see, what were some? Um, Oh, you know when she talks about the eye, the double eyelid surgery? 
um, that, that was cut. And the, the whole idea of her wanting to be a movie star, that was cut. Um, what else? Um, yeah. Yeah. There, when a, yeah, there was a moment when Elizabeth, the second daughter, is fighting. Um, yeah, it's when, when, um, when the narrator is talking about Wong Pei-san's daughter and saying she's a viper who liked tea eggs. That was cut. Um, and also the line, the, the, the sort of the escalating fight between her and Elizabeth um, when Elizabeth says, you know, uh, I didn't ask to be born, you know, um, that, that was cut as well. So there were just things that I think were maybe, you know, kind of going one step further, you know, in the, in, in the scene and, 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 um, and it just, it, I guess it, it didn't need to be there for this, this version. Yeah. Other, other questions? Yes. When you ended the story, how far away were you from the actual ending? Oh, um, there's probably about like 10 more pages, 10 or 15 more pages, yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's quite a long story. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was talking about this, um, you know, during the class today, um, that I thought um, how I wanted to hit sort of a, like a wider range of notes. Like I felt like my stories and transparency, they often are kind of <laughs> melancholy, you know. Um, and, and so um, I, I, I think I was, I, I was pleased with this story just in that I felt like I was, you know, kind of branching out and, 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 and being more humorous. Um, inserting more humor in, in the stories. And I've already said this before, but I, I think that the, the humor itself is, a, is really arising from the characters. Um, I, I, I really love Woody Allen's films, but you know, those, those characters are just like, sort of very obsessive and um, they're sort of trapped by who they are and they, keep, they, they can't help themselves and they keep acting the way that they do. And for some reason, I find that really funny, <laughs> really funny. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, 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 and I think that if, if, I didn't, if I didn't find them funny, then I, I wouldn't really you know, care too much about the characters themselves. It's a way of humanizing them, um, but it's, it's also a way of, if, of senti not sentimentalizing the characters. Yeah, no, I'm really, I'm really pleased with um, how the story, you know, it is in, appears in the New Yorker, and um, I think that maybe like the things that were cut might, might, as I said, might just take it a little step further and might be kind of darker um, to some extent. Um, but I do think that there were things that maybe were too emphatic, and I go on for too long about things, and it was probably a, a good thing that that some things were, were cut. Um, I didn't insert all the things that were cut. There, you know, there's probably a little bit more. So. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, well, I would. The first one that comes to mind is Alice Munro. I, I really, I really love her. Um, I, I just, I just feel like she's always seems to be subverting the, um, the sort of the typical uh, short story uh, narrative arc. Like she's always surprising me, um, and I'm always, I'm not, I'm never really, I'm never frustrated with those surprises. You know, I never um, disbelieve them. I'm always delighted by them. So I like how her stories just. Um, take these, you know, unusual shapes, and um, they're just unpredictable in that way. And, and she does things that, like in writer's workshops, you're told not to do, you know, but she does them, and, and they're, they can be jarring at first, but then you, this, her, her writing is so good, the narrative is so compelling, that you, you're still, you, st you, you trust her, you trust this writer, and you, and you keep reading. Um, other, other short story writers that I love, um, Mary Gateskill, uh, she's really dark and, and edgy. Um, Laurie Moore, I think, is is, is really hilarious. Um, uh, she's just she's just so sharp and funny. Um, 
trying to think of other writers that I really like. Um, Deborah Eisenberg, of course. Joy Williams, um, who was my mentor. She, I really admire her work. Um, Dennis Johnson, I love Jesus' son. Uh, Juno Diaz is great. <laughs> and I heard he came here last year. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and on. Yeah, it, it, I, was I was really happy about that. And I think that when I write stories, I'm often thinking about how far I can go in this. I, I, I mean, this, I think this is inspired by Alice Monroe, but just this idea of how far can I go in this direction that doesn't seem to be related. You know, that, seem, that doesn't seem, you don't really understand why I'm writing about this. But I'm, it's sort of like this, this tangent. It almost seems like a digression. But I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm doing that because I want to sort of surprise the reader and take the reader off guard. Um, but I'm not kind of treading the usual, you know, the, the steps. Like you can't, um, you can't really predict where the story is going. So I, I guess I'm, I'm finding a lot of pleasure in the stories sort of kind of seeming like they're digressing or wandering, but that actually it's, you know, it's, it's by the end, it's, you're going to see why I wrote, I wrote those scenes. Um, I think that a model for this is um, John Cheever's uh, story, um, The Country Husband. Um, I don't know if you've read that. But the story starts out with like his, this character's plane is about to crash. And then it goes to him, him um, going back to his family and sort of like this miserable <laughs> domestic <laughs> life that he has. And then he begins like having, you know, kind of uh, trying to hit on the babysitter. I mean, it just takes all these different paths. He's, then he's at a dinner party and there's um, the woman who's a, the maid serving them. He notices that um, when he was fighting in the war, like in France, she was there. You know, I mean, it's just all these, you know, very, um, th these things that don't, that don't, immediately connect, but, but it feels like organic, you know, and, um, and it's surprising for that reason. Any other questions? Thank you, Thank you so much.